Hey guys, it's Greg Atkinson. I am so excited to be speaking at this youth ministry conference and um, shout out to all the people putting it together behind the scenes. Thank you for allowing me to be a part. Um, if you know me, I speak on um, leadership and first impressions, guest experience, guest services. And I don't think I've ever spoke at a youth ministry conference before, even though I have a background in youth ministry and started out as uh, back in the early 90s, uh, almost 30 years ago, as a minister of music and youth and have taken, have taken several uh, youth trips, taken youth on trips to all kinds of stuff all over. And so I'm very familiar with that. I've done my share of lock-ins. I've put in my dues, put in my time. But I want to encourage you guys that lead in youth ministry and that shepherd and pastor students. Uh, I'm a dad of three kids. I have a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 16-year-old. And until my oldest just turned 20, I had three teenagers. And so I'm very familiar, not only as a pastor, but as a parent with youth ministry. And I will tell you, all three of my kids are different and unique and special. None of them are, are alike when it comes right down to it. I have one who's very uh, social, very outgoing, very bubbly. She just is um, smiling from ear to ear and radiant when she walks in a room. I have a, uh, another who is very intelligent, very, uh, very, very short with his words, very, very, uh, very direct, um, but also very, uh, very musical and uh, big, big heart. And then I have another daughter that is very artistic, very creative, also very intelligent, but um, she struggles with mental illness and she struggles with anxiety and depression. She struggles with anxiety so bad that we had to pull her out of public school. And so she goes to school online. So I understand as a pastor and as a parent, how to shepherd and love and care for people that are wired differently, that have different needs, that have different backgrounds, that have different emotions, that have different drives. And so um, uh, my daughter is um, a beautiful, creative, brilliant, intelligent daughter, um, but she just freaks out around people and around crowds. And so I understand that ministry, and this is my talk for today, is more about people than programs. Uh, I was on staff at a, at a large church here in Charlotte area, and one of our values was people over production. And um, what I want to talk about today in the context of youth ministry is people over programs. And also, you could say people over production. So when you think of me I write and speak and teach and coach and consult with the largest churches in the country on first impressions and guest experience. And yes, when I travel to a church and I evaluate them, I evaluate their production. I evaluate their sound, video, lights, music, production. I take in all of that as a secret shopper. However, I also on my report look for things like was the congregation friendly? Did anybody speak to me? Um, was the pastor available after the service? I don't care if I'm working with one of the largest churches in America. I want to see the pastor available after the service. And so youth pastor, there's no time to be Mr. or Mrs. Cool. Mr. or Mrs. You can't get close to me. What makes ministry special, what makes ministry foundational and essential to me, I've said for years and I've written about ministry is people. And so as pastors, as shepherds, as leaders, if you're a volunteer leader, or lay leader watching this conference, we must, we must be approachable, accessible, relatable, personable, and kind. And so when I think of first impressions, and yes, I like I said, I, I write and speak and teach on this, I talk about the biblical mandate, the biblical teaching on hospitality, which is to welcome the stranger, welcome the newcomer, 
from Old Testament to New Testament, we are told to welcome the stranger and to practice, or some translations say, show hospitality. How do we do that? By focusing on the person, the individual, people over programs. Um, part of my story is I am where I am today. I'm in my mid 40s, coming up on nearly 30 years in ministry. Uh, this month is 27 years for me. I started in 1994 and it's 2021. So it's been 27 years of ministry. And I am where I am today because of my youth pastor, Roger Sims, who took time with me, who was present. If you're taking notes, write down people, write down person, write down presence. Um, Roger Sims led a large youth group back then in the uh, 80s and early 90s when I was in youth ministry in high school. We were part of a, a large church in our small city, but we had 100 youth, and 100 youth is a big youth group. When you have 100 students showing up on Wednesday night uh, for Bible study and Wednesday night activities, that's a big group. However, out of those 100 students, we all felt loved and valued and appreciated and get this seen by Roger Sims. I often, when I teach on hospitality, I talk about the movie Avatar. If you remember the indigenous people in Avatar, one of the ways they communicated with each other was to say, I see you, I see you. I cannot tell you how much that means to my kids, my children, um, Grace, Tommy, Katie, all so unique, precious, beautiful children of God, precious in their own ways, but for them to be seen and known, that's what hospitality ministry is about, that people, people over programs, people are seen and known. I remember one time Roger Sims took me and two buddies, three guys on a retreat out of a youth group of over a hundred kids. He took up a weekend, took the church van and took me and two of my best friends on a retreat and spent the entire weekend investing in us three. When I was 15, uh, Roger, resigned and moved to a new position in ministry somewhere else. He had been at the church since I was born for 15 years from birth to age 15. And we were devastated um, all throughout the rest of high school. And even in college, I remember in college telling my college roommate, I just had a dream or a nightmare about my high school youth pastor leaving the church. He had that kind of impact on me. It was so personable, so relational that I was devastated when he left. But I was dating a girl who was involved in another local church and in another healthy youth group. And so I started since Roger had left and I had no need to be at the church I had grown up in and I was able to drive. And my parents said, you can go wherever you want as long as you're in church. So I went to this other local church uh, which changed my life because I became the high school intern. I became the leader in the youth group and the senior pastor and the worship pastor took me under their arm and, and under their wing and invested in me. Jerry Stepp, my mentor, dear friend and pastor, spent time with me as a 16 year old high school student investing in me. Not only did he prepare me he was a worship pastor. Not only did he prepare me to audition for a music scholarship, which I got and I went on a music scholarship to college, but not only did he prepare me for that and meet with me every day after school to go over music and to teach me how to sing in Italian. Not only did he drive me down to uh, Charleston where uh, I went to college and accompany me on piano as I auditioned for my music scholarship. Not only that, but Jerry Stepp, took me with him. So when he went to visit the sick and shut in, guess who went with him? Greg. 
when he went to visit the nursing homes, guess who led worship for the first time in a nursing home? Greg, I was leading hymns in a nursing home. It was the first place I've ever led worship. I've led worship all over the world for thousands of people, but the very first time was to sweet older people who may have had dementia, may have had Alzheimer's, may have been out of their mind. But when I started singing the old hymns, they came back and they knew every single word and they sang with me. Um, when Jerry went on, on visitation and out to visit people, they took me with them. When they went to the hospital, I was making hospital visits as a 16 year old kid now, over the years and nearly 30 years of ministry, I can't tell you how many times I have done a hospital visit as a pastor, but Jerry took me along with him. Friends, this is people over programs. Even more specific than people, this is a person. He saw me, he invested in me and look at me today. These are my books behind me. I train people in ministry. I teach pastors, I consult with churches, I coach pastors, but it all, hear me, it all started with youth ministry and how my youth pastor and my worship pastor invested in me. And get this, I was not the perfect kid. I was the kid that got kicked off the trips and sent home for fighting. One year, I literally, my senior year in high school, got kicked off a summer trip and sent home for fighting with my best friend. And the next year, as a freshman in college, I took a group of youth back to the same camp as their chaperone and leader and youth pastor at the age of 18. I was in youth ministry. God can do amazing radical things and turn around a life, so do not give up on people even if you think they are not paying attention, they hear you, they're listening. They may look like they're tuning out, but they hear you. Don't give up on them. I was one of those kids. I acted out. I started fights. I picked on some of my lay leaders. I made fun of one of my um, uh, youth leaders, Steve Gahagan, who was an overweight man. And I used to pick at him and poke at him. Well, guess who's overweight now? God had the last laugh, but I used to be a troublemaker, but God was working on my heart and he used people, not programs. Now hear me, this is what's so important. I told you my favorite youth pastor out of, out of 45 years of life, my favorite will always be Roger Sims, who I grew up with and who invested in me and spent time with me but listen to this, this is important. Are you listening? Roger was at my church 15 years. He led a youth group of 100 people. We met every Wednesday night for a big youth group. We did lock-ins, we did rallies, we did fifth quarters, we did Sunday morning, we did Sunday night, we did all that. But hear me, I do not remember a single message, a single sermon that he ever preached. Not a one. I do not. I know you're working every week, week in and week out, preparing a message, preparing a talk. Listen to me. That's great. I don't remember a single one. What I do remember is he saw me and he spent time with me and he loved me just as I was. And he invested in me. And I knew Roger cared. And that's what cut through to this heart. Not the sermons, not the Bible exposition, not the breaking down of special series. And guess what series we're in this month? None of that. It was relationship. It was personal. It was a pastor investing in a student. So hear me from a heart of hospitality. It is always relational. Ministry is always people first. People over programs, people over production. And treat them as individuals. My three kids could not be more different. And I have to approach them as a dad in three different ways. I have 
group texts where I text the three of them and tell them I love them. I'm proud of them. You're a child of God. That's your identity. You're a beloved child of God. I've been um, instilling that in them since they were very young. If you ask my kids, what's your identity? They'll say, I'm a beloved child of God. They know that. But I also text them individually. I text my daughter who's off at college and I say, how are you doing? How's class going? How's work going? I text my son who's a senior getting ready to go to college and is interviewing with colleges. He interviewed with Georgetown University last week in Washington, D.C. I was so proud of him. He's already got two academic scholarships. He's already been accepted to two colleges and he's waiting to hear back for more later in the year. I'm so proud of him. So I speak to him individually. He had to wear a tie for his interview with Georgetown. So I helped him with that. I talked to him individually. And then my youngest who struggles with anxiety and depression and mental illness, I do as well. I spoke at the church mental health summit. I've struggled with mental issues for years and I take medicine and I see a therapist and it's okay. And I've spoken out openly about it. And so I relate to her in ways that I, that I do not relate to my other two kids because I know what it's like to have to take medicine and to have to see a counselor. I know what it's like to have anxiety. I wrote a uh, devotional for U, the YouVersion Bible app on anxiety. I get it. I understand anxiety. So I do individual texts to each of my kids and I do group texts to let them all know dad loves you. I'm praying for you. Here's a scripture I want you to think on, but hear me. It's people over programs, people over production. I don't care if you do sound, video, lights, production, smoke, fog, haze. I don't care if you have the best rocking band in the world and you sound like the belonging co. I don't care. I'm telling you at the end of the day, hear me. I do not remember a single message or sermon from my childhood and teenage years. And I was a kid who was in church every week, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. I was there and they worked hard on their messages, but I do not remember them. I do remember their presence. And I remember the time they took with me. And I remember them answering questions I remember them putting their arm around me and hugging me, supporting me, and never shaming me. Yes, I was the kid that got sent home from youth group and from uh, youth camp, but they never shamed me. They may tell me they were disappointed, or Greg, you can do better, or Greg, we know, we know this isn't your heart. You know, as a kid, I got bullied a lot. I haven't always been 6'5 and looking like an NFL lineman, if you were to see me these days. I haven't always been like that. When I was a kid, I was picked on and I was bullied. And then when I got older and I was a junior and senior in high school and I started wrestling and playing football and started working out, there was something in me that said, I am tired of being bullied. I am tired of being picked on. And I started pushing back and that's where the fights come from. But everybody has a story. I think of that quote that Brene Brown says, be kind for everyone is facing a battle that we're not aware of. We do not know the battles that these kids who walk in to our youth groups each week are facing. This past year, 2020 with COVID, they say it's record high depression, record high suicide rates, I know as a parent and I hear from others all across my social media on Facebook and, and Instagram, how hard it has been to transition, not only to doing school online when the school wasn't that prepared and it's not that great quality and the, the way they're doing assignments and homework has not been ideal. And it's been a hard transition for the kids, for the students, but also relationally them missing their peers and then having fear of going through a pandemic and not wanting to get COVID. My kids don't go anywhere. And if they were to ever leave the house, they have a mask on no matter what. They are freaked out about getting COVID. I've never said anything to them. They just watch the news and they pay attention on social media. But kids are stressed these days. Highest depression rates, highest suicide rates. 
life is tough right now and you have an opportunity to make a difference in a kid's life. Yes, you lead a group, but you can make a difference in one person's life. I am the product not only of an amazing youth ministry, but more specifically and more accurately of an amazing youth pastor who saw me, loved me, and invested in me. God bless you as you serve and lead each and every week. I pray that um, every student will be known and heard and seen fully loved and fully known. That's the heartbeat of hospitality and ministry. God bless you. Goodbye.